Good evening and welcome to the Whitwam Organics Weekly Garden Report. This week we have a special guest with us that we're going to talk to. Uh, remember, as I'm going through uh, the Weekly Garden Report and uh, going through my interview, um, please, if you have any questions or comments, you are more than welcome to uh, post them and we can see them and we will respond. Um, so this week's guest is a friend of mine, Kendrick. Uh, he is a master of a uh, wonderful plant that's known uh, around the world as a miracle, uh, a miracle tree. And we'll kind of get into why, if you have not heard of Moringa, you are going to. Um, so that's kind of what we're going to talk about today after I get through our weekly garden report. So, um, Let's jump into the report. So pretty much it's obvious what I have to report. It feels really good outside, y'all. Uh, if you're not out there in the garden, you need to be. Um, fall is upon us. We are um, looking at at least a week, maybe a week and a half of um, lower temperatures. I think it's going to sustain. Let me back up. I know we got at least a week and a week and a half. I think it's going to sustain. Uh, for great fall crops. Uh, when we're seeing anything between the mid 80s to lower 80s for daytime highs and uh, upper 60s to lower 70s, uh, that is just ripe weather for what we would consider our warm weather crops. Um, in the blink of an eye, um, I see people asking me, you know, is it too hot? Is it too hot? Is it too hot? And then we go for a couple weeks and then the questions are, is it too cold? Is it too cold? Is it too cold? Well, you know, if, if you don't want it to be too hot or you don't want it to be too cold, you really need to be out there uh, busting your butt in your garden and getting that stuff growing when it's not too hot and it's not too cold. So the plants that we're focusing on this time of year are what I refer to as the Goldilocks plants. They don't like it too hot and they don't like it too cold. So that would be your peppers, your uh, tomatoes, eggplants, uh, beans, uh, pole beans, bush beans, yellow squash, zucchini, um, melons. Uh, so pretty much I, I'd say most of people's, if you took a room of 100 people and kind of polled them and figured out which ones really, 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 really like vegetables, okay, we're going to get rid of them. We don't want them. And then the people who don't ever eat vegetables at all, okay, we're going to get rid of them. Well, everybody who's left over, the people who eat vegetables and kind of enjoy them, all the stuff that they eat, this is the time of year to grow it, okay? So the 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 the, the uh, most popular vegetables are what really are what we call our fall and our spring vegetables. Again, they're not really the winter vegetables. They don't like it too cold. They don't need it too cold. And they definitely don't like the peak of the summertime. So that's really the crops that we're focusing on. If you've been following along with me, we've been gearing up for this day for so since the end of July when we were planting our seeds of our tomato plants that we have been planting out in our gardens over the past few weeks. Um, last week, we um, did not see a whole lot of sun. Um, uh, we had a lot of days of, uh, of a lot of clouds. It was still really hot and humid outside. Um, and I got to be honest with you, a lot of our seedlings on our seed tables came in a little bit on the leggy side. Um, so if you, you know, had stuff in your garden or on your seed tables and leggy means it grew kind of too, too long, too fast. Cause it was reaching for sunlight. Um, so, you know, you're not necessarily doing anything wrong. It's just, if the stuff's not getting enough light, um, the plants can kind of stretch out a little bit. So we saw some of that. Um, we're kind of coming to the tail end of battling the white flies that we've um, been messing with for the past, um, couple weeks. Um, again, one of the things I've been doing is we've been rotating the plants around to the middle of our nursery, which is where we have our fans. And um, white flies are terrible flyers. And if you can at least keep those uh, adults occupied and, um, and make it a little more difficult for them to fly around and land on your plants, you're going to be doing a lot better. It's one of the reasons why there's such a big um, greenhouse pest is really when they get in those greenhouses, uh, unless there's good ventilation, and they get set up in there, it's, you're done for, you gotta, you gotta intervene with something, um, you know, and your lace wigs and other predatory insects that would attack the white flies, they might not be able to find their way into the greenhouse. 
Um, but if you're outside, hopefully you're in an area that you can uh, get some decent ventilation. But just know, you know, to all, th uh, all, all things come to an end. And we're kind of coming to the end of the uh, white fly problem. Um, and, uh, you know, we we'll probably won't see them again really bad until later on uh, next uh, spring. Um, as far as uh, stuff that we're planting out in our gardens, we're also uh, doing some of our last sweet potato harvest right now. Um, I know there's people out there who grow sweet potatoes year round. I know there's people out there that leave them in the ground longer. Um, for me, what I have found, and if you're watching and you actually know the name of it, please post it in the comments. I found that when I leave my sweet potatoes in past the beginning of October to November, um, they get those little holes in it. And I, it's, I'm assuming some sort of weevil or beetle or something that lives in the soil that bores holes in those sweet potatoes. Really, if you want them, um, and you want to, uh, have them have a longer shelf life, you need to get them out of the ground before whatever that thing is uh, shows up and starts boring holes in it. Again, if you're watching uh, now or later and you actually know the name of what that is, please post it in the comments so that I can uh, be informed as well. Um, we have planted uh, seeds uh, both on the seed tables and out in gardens of uh, pole beans and bush beans. Those are already up. Some of our pole beans that we planted just a few weeks ago, they've already started searching for um, a trellis to climb up, which I will go go ahead and interject with this. Um, definitely on the list of the top five things, maybe top 10 things that I see gardeners, new gardeners make mistakes at. And one of them, um, and it kind of goes with plant spacing, but one of them is they don't really think ahead to trellising uh, for their plants. So they, they really... Um, just kind of throw everything in the ground and maybe have a medium sized tomato cage on their tomatoes, put cucumbers in. Don't really think about what the cucumbers are going to climb up. Pole beans. They're not thinking about what the pole beans are going to climb up. If your plants need something to climb on or need something to attach to at least be thinking about it when you plant and start gathering materials that you're going to need um, to trellis that stuff up as it grows. Um, it's very stressful on big uh, vining plants or tomato plants to have to pick up these huge plants and like, you know, tie them up onto a trellis, uh, you know, cucumbers and melons. When those things are growing, their leaves are pointing right in the perfect direction that they need to be pointed to, to get perfect sun on their leaves, like solar panels. So you're taking this long vine and flopping it up onto a trellis now you got leaves that are backwards and not facing the right way. Those tend to be the first leaves that show signs of powdery mildew or downy mildew or something like that. Um, so, you know, really for people who are just starting out with their gardens, just it's kind of one of the things that gets forgotten. They think about their sun and their water and their soil and what they're buying for seeds and where they're planting what. And, and just really think about, think through your garden, um, you know, you definitely don't want your stuff that grows tall and needs a trellis on the south side of smaller stuff that might need the sunlight because it's going to block the sunlight. So just not only be thinking about positioning of your stuff, but also what materials you're going to use. If you're going to use bamboo, start collecting that bamboo. This is not something you want to do as an afterthought. I see it happen time and time again, and I'm guilty of it every year, at least in some gardens, because just time becomes a factor we planned on doing it this week or next week and it doesn't get done. And so I'm, I'm speaking from personal experience. It's very difficult. It's very hard on the plants to make your trellising of the plants an afterthought. So other than that, guys, the weather's beautiful. Um, I've been talking about this for a couple of weeks that the cool down, the big cool down, that's what this is. This is the big cool down uh, for fall. Um, it happens sometime between the last week of September could be all the way up to the first week of November. Average is the second week of October. So this year we were, you know, a couple of weeks early. And that's when I kind of where I like to plan my gardens around that. I'd rather be early than late. Um, it, you know, I just, I'd rather lose some stuff. Gam I'm going to gamble on the early side if I'm going to gamble. I know some of y'all like to play it safe and kind of wait for the stuff to cool off. But, you know, I know for a fact that short days are coming. I know for a fact that cooler weather than this is coming that some of these warm weather crops aren't going to like. 
So if I got to roll the dice and take a bet, I'm going to bet on the early side of things. I'd rather lose because I guess too early than lose because I waited too late. But, you know, just some advice if you're trying to, if you're new to gardening, um, get out there, get your stuff going. Uh, I do want to do another episode on um, whether or not you should be planting seeds or starts. Uh, if you're going to do seeds, talk about potting soil. I think we might do that next week because, um, you know, everybody, if you're gardening right now, you should be right up in the middle of uh, straight seeding stuff out into your garden or trying to start your own seeds in trays or whether or not you go to a store and buy transplants or start so i we're going to cover that next week the episode i did on that a few weeks ago my audio was terrible um and it was all garbled most of the time so we're going to kind of redo that one um so that's what we got to look forward to next week but we are not in next week we're in this week and this week we have kendrick from the moringa growers co-op uh super awesome unique organization um I'm going to bring him in uh, because I'm not here to talk about Moringa. Kendrick is here to talk about Moringa. What's up, man? Hey, how's it going? It's going well. How you doing? Doing great. Thank you. Very, very cool. So you, my friend, were not always a Moringa grower, were you? No. No? You were, no. You were what, an architect? I'm an architect, yes. You, you are an architect. Yeah. How the heck did you uh, get from being an architect into growing or uh, being a farmer? It was my health. Honestly, I was really sick. Up until I was 25, I had never planted a seed. And I had severe irritable bowel syndrome, constipation, uh, on the verge of Crohn's disease. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't know anything about nutrition, eating, my blood type. And I, I stumbled upon Dr. Sebi in my research. And I heard Dr. about who? Dr. Sebi, S E B I. Dr. Sebi. S Dr. Sebi. Dr. S E V I? B, S E B I, Dr. Sebi. B as in boy? Yes. Okay. And Go ahead. so uh, along that journey of researching with Dr. Sebi and hearing about moringa, uh, blood and starch foods uh, in our system. And my blood type, I started to cleanse and detox using Moringa. Uh -huh. And I heard about Moringa from Dr. Sebi in about 2013 when I was actually in my Master's of Architecture program at USF, not too far from here. So from there, I started to cleanse and I did a 30-day fast on water and Moringa. Ooh. And uh, it changed my life and I haven't had any problems digesting my food since then. It was mostly just cleansing my liver, uh, which was the biggest issue. And then from there, my blood uh, had better circulation. My stools became more regular, and I started going to the bathroom every day. I noticed that my skin got a lot better. My aura was stronger. My energy was pumping. After those 30 days, I went down to like 130 pounds, and I built it back up over time. This was, you know, seven years ago now. Right. And – uh during the middle of going to school, my life completely twisted upside down. And I said that I, I, I learned about plants and seeds and this Moringa tree and the benefits that I received from it. And I, was, I said to myself that I wanted to be a farmer. And I wanted to take my, my sustainable practices that I was learning in school, going, you know, doing projects and traveling the world while going to school and, uh, and gear it towards building farms. I want, I'm an, I'm a farm tech. I essentially, uh, I don't do, uh, jobs for houses or I don't do jobs for commercial or high rise buildings. I'm specific to building farms and, uh, and developing farmland. So, so when you were in school, you were already, you, you were already kind of thinking in the direction of sustainability Yes, all of my skyscraper models, they were all filled with trees, and I always okay. had trees okay. on all my models. The, the professors would rip off okay. all my models and stuff, so I was already in that direction. I actually started um, my collegiate career in 2005 as an aerospace engineer, and then from there transferred over to USF and completed a master's in architecture. 
And during that time that I was going to school, actually, I was trying to find a way to support myself. So I took the $10,000 a semester that I received from the federal grants, and I actually went and bought vending machines. And I bought vending machines, and over the course of four years, I bought 31 vending machines and was making about $30,000, $40,000 a year cash off those wow. vending machines. So that way, when I graduated college, I was able to sell that business the day that I graduated, and that's how I started the co-op, and that's how I started Newman Nursery. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's really a great story, man. Um, uh, finally, somebody was getting creative with those. Those were loans, right? Were they yeah. loans or okay? Uh, Ten thousand uh, dollar federal grants. You know, we still um, are working on the repayment schedule, but sure. myself, I have not actually uh, made any money yet because it's all been going back to the business. There hasn't been any profit, so to speak. It's all been capital going right back into the business. So I'm able to uh, defer those loans until I. Uh, Till myself can actually earn an income and a salary off of these companies that I started. So about these companies that you started. So let's see, you, uh, you finished school, uh, at USF, um, you got your degree. Um, did you do anything for a little while in that yeah. field or? Oh yes, okay. absolutely. You know, I've done several years of internships. I also started a, a, a studio, an architecture studio with a partner from school. And we took on a couple projects, a few clients. We've done a few things here and there, and it's still active. We still pick up jobs. We we do odd things, furniture, you know, a lot, you know, and educational programs, school, summer schools for architecture students that are coming into it, uh, middle schoolers, high schoolers, and uh, and so, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm in it every day. People always ask me every day at the farmers market. They're like, Kendrick, what are you doing? Aren't you an architect? And I tell them, you know, architecture is philosophy it's theoretics it's the ideas it's the art it's the it's everything behind the scenes that you don't necessarily see about how and who and what is driving society in certain directions that's sure. all we're doing we're ideas men and women and so the idea of pushing uh you know civilization to this next level it requires really in-depth thinking and 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 i said if i really wanted to make a change if i really wanted to get into this uh, sovereign food scarcity, uh, you know, industry that I was really struggling with because I couldn't find any of the foods that I wanted to eat. So during that process of cleansing and detoxing, I completely went plant-based and I, I struggled finding good food that I could eat that without sugar, without refined foods, without being in a box, you know, all those things that I wanted to eat fresh, live, whole foods, you know, right there at my fingertips. How can we make that more accessible to people? As an architect, I'm solving problems every day. So I have not stepped a moment away from my ultimate goal, my manifesto, everything that I think about every day. It all ties back into my main goal of, of architecture. So when you you got out of school, you've done some work with, with architecture. Like what was that defining moment? I mean, you said, I you know, what with um with with your issues and with your cleanse, um, you know, I think that's probably when you maybe internally, am I right? Vowed, yes. Yes. Uh, or 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 that's when the bug got near. I'm not sure exactly how long the uh, wapow aha moment took after that. If it was immediate, if it was during it, but that's internally. Externally, though, something had to happen or change. Yeah. Um, I, you know, was it? Uh, did you meet somebody? Did you did you stumble upon a property? Um, like what? How did you how did you get from point A to point B? Of uh, you know, I hear what you're saying that you're still applying all that stuff. Yeah, but I'm still gonna say that you've had a change of direction. Totally. And, <laughs> okay. And so and what and was the actual? <laughs> I'll tell you what it was. Having that vending machine business really got me thinking about cash and flow. And that investment of putting something, say, for 30 cents that I purchased for 30 cents into a machine and get $2 out uh, really intrigued me. And making that flip, I had been making flips and had my first business at the age of 14. I started a candy candy business in high school. And so I just kind of like, kept that on that. yeah, I was that candy man. You were that guy. I'm the candy man. And so just trying to take that, taking that seed, 
taking that one seed, knowing that that seed was worth a penny, putting it right. in soil, and then selling that plant for two dollars or five dollars. I'm like, whoa, what a flip! And this is nature. You know, this is something that is just being created on its own. I didn't have to have too many inputs, and it could potentially be something that I could grow my architecture studio while on the side have have a business that's supporting me that I morally uh, agree with because I didn't necessarily agree at that time with candy and sodas sure. as it was my lifestyle was changing and so I wanted to um, support myself off of nature and education and so I, I devoted myself to learning and studying and teaching everyone about farming and planting that seed that moment that I planted that first seed and I saw that grow into something that I could eat it changed my life and I said there's no going back so that was when, uh, like, what was next? So you kind of started uh, Numa Nurseries, right? Yeah, so crazy story. I had a van that I purchased from that those federal student loans. And uh, I said, I'm going to start a plant nursery. And so that's the first step to, to have a farm. You got to start with plants and pots. You know, that's what I thought. I didn't have any land. I, I just moved to Tampa. I didn't, you know, my, my, my dad was in Florida, but I, I was alone, essentially, on my own. And so... Uh, I, I came up with this crazy idea and to advertise on my van. So I started painting my van on the beach. And while I was painting my van on the beach, a couple came up to me and said, Hey, you have a nursery, a plant nursery. And I said, well, it's, it's in my head. And they said, well, we have one. If you'd like, you can come by and visit sometime. And so I took their number down and a few weeks later I went there to visit and I left that day with a job and I was still in school at the time. So I said, you know, this would just be part time. I really just want to learn. Can I please just come and learn from you? And sure enough, uh, we built a relationship and they taught me how to run a plant nursery. And crazy story is that I purchased the land that I'm on right now from those from that family that I met. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I'm was actually it the same, was it the same land that their nursery was on or just another piece of land that they owned? It was a father son team. I, oh. I met the son, and then later on, I started working for the father here on this property. Five years ago, I was working here on this two-and-a-half-acre property that I just bought. And one, they told me when I was working here, they said, Kendrick, one day you're going to own this place. And this was five <laughs> years ago. That's a great story, man. So yeah, that's New right. Nursery. Yeah. Um, and then – but that's um, – I, I that, we're just all kind of leading up to the yeah. pursuito. Which, like, how do we get from Numa Nursery to the Moringa Growers Co-op? Exactly. Um, so as, as I was studying and learning from my mentors, my nursery mentors, uh, his father and my friend, uh, I said, well, where do I start? And they said, well, start with your first five plants. You know, get your first five down. And they said, what's your first one going to be? And I said, uh, Moringa. And they said, oh, we have Moringa here, but we don't, we don't have enough sunlight here. Um, and we have 80 plants that are left over from the sale. Do you want them? And I had 80 trees for that day's worth of work that they donated to me for that day. And so I put those 80 trees in my van and I started planting those trees on other people's properties. I started knocking door to door and I said, hey, I have a Moringa tree. Can I plant this tree in your backyard? And uh, they're like, for what? And I said, well, it's food. And I want to start growing this to produce food for myself and to possibly sell so that way I could put them in my vending machines. Okay, hold on, hold on, back up. So this was when this was when those uh, two guys still own the land and the property and they donated 80 trees to you. I get it. Okay, so at that point you didn't have anywhere to put the trees. No, I was, uh, I was just living in, in an apartment at the time and I didn't have any land or anything close to campus. Uh -huh. And uh, they said, well, you can have these 80 trees for a day's worth of work. So I put those 80 trees in my van and I started going door to door saying, can I get these trees in your yard? I didn't know anybody. I just started going door to door thinking who might like it, who might want it. Little by little, I started asking around and I'm going to school. Nobody at campus has property land. But then right. sure enough, little by little, like some of my peers in school would be like, yo, what are you doing? And I was like, well, you have a rental property, right? And they're like, yeah. And I was like, well, let's just plant some trees there and see what happens. These are the fastest growing trees in the world. I mean, in a year, we're going to have a ton of food that we can sell. We can cultivate it. We can we can dry it. We can harvest it. And then we can put it on the market as a powder or a tea or a capsule. And they're like, 
this is crazy, man. What are you doing? And I'm like, well, so, I'm trying to support myself. So how many of your peers at that point? Because I, I, I remember being that age. How many of the people your age were just tagging along because they just wanted something fun and different to do with this crazy guy? And how yeah. many were tagging along because they really – saw your vision and believed in it. I, I think I already know the answer, but Dude, that's kind of nuts. Everybody Planning thought I was through. nuts. Everybody yeah. thought I was nuts. They, they were like, what is this guy doing? And I kind of was a little bit of an outcast a little bit because I had these crazy ideas in school. And, and there's a curriculum that they have to follow, you know? So I, I broke it every day, broke the mold, changed it up every time I had a chance and uh, that's 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 what I did. And ever ever since then, it's been on the ground running, planting these trees everywhere. Now we have 300 properties in the co-op, just in the Tampa Bay area. Thousands of moringa trees every single day. As you know, I'm going out 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 and about, going to town. I'm harvesting these trees back, and now we're bringing them back to the property here. We have a um, a drying facility, a processing facility. And uh, everything's blown up. It's been amazing. So that's really uh, that actually brings up my next my my next question. Like, so you plant these eighty trees, right? And uh, well, first of all, like, how many? About how many places did it take for you to find eighty? Was that was that four places or twenty places before trees each? Or like, about how many places did you did you have to find these eighty trees? Yeah, it started out about about ten. I had good ten solid runs, you know, ten solid people. Okay, so, so eight trees per house, ten houses average. Yeah. Okay, so then and, these trees start growing, right? And you said, like you said, in the first year, um, now you got all this moringa, yeah. green, with branches on it and stuff. At that point, were you like, holy crap? Like, what do I do now? Because obviously. Yeah. You can't go humping just a bunch of branches of moringa to people on the side of the road and have them buy it, right? Yeah, you so got to make it look good. Be, you got to do something with it, whether it's dry it or like, how did you get from that point? Well, first of all, were you were you were you with it enough to think about that while the stuff was growing, or did you do Definitely. probably what I would have done, and that's waited until I have all this stuff and I'm like, oh crap, what do I what do I do now? Well, luckily, uh, you know, my education had me in the technology world. Uh, luckily, my business already had me in the products world. And so I kind of merged my, my skills that I had on the computer, pretty, pretty much making images from scratch. And I started making my own labels. And so I used that skill. And, I, uh, and to this day, I've made every single one of my labels, every single one of my products I've made by hand. And... Uh, and so I started using glass bottles with stickers that I could just print out from a printer at home. I mean, we still print out most of our labels from home and uh, and we're in stores all over the country. So, I mean, you can still manage to work from home and still have a, a legitimate business. So you, you skipped a step on me, dude. <laughs> so I no no, that's awesome because that would have been my next question. But like, how did you get? from the stuff on the tree to what you put in the bottle like you know what i'm saying like did you yeah. already think it through and have this drying oh, man. Facility? or were you like doing it like most entrepreneurs in your bathtub and out on your kitchen counters and stuff it was everywhere my roommates were kicking me out i had to get new places to live everywhere i went they're like you can't be bringing all i'm bringing i'm stripping greens off i'm hanging greens from the kitchen ceiling and they're like you can't have all this around here and i'm like don't breathe on this stuff man this is medicine you know so it was wild and then finally um i i started studying you know and i started traveling and it's funny you asked that because i spent a few weeks in cambodia learning how to farm moringa trees using uh, the Wolf Program. It's W W O O F, okay. and I became a moringa farmer in Cambodia. We traveled the country there uh, in search of uh, techniques that uh, indigenous farmers would would uh, dry and bring their uh, product to market. And that was the key: was the market. And I was like, wait, there's a farmers market right next to the university. Every day I pass by it. There's a farmers market right near school. And I said, why don't I go ahead and try to see if I can get into this farmer's market? 
And so that summer that I graduated from college, I started attending the farmer's market with one booth, one table, and one product on my table. And that was Moringa powder, Moringa capsules, and Moringa tea. And that's all I had. And that's what pretty much uh, that day, actually, I, I, I found they found me. They're like, hey, well, what do you have there? And I said, oh, this is Moringa. Sure enough, several of the co-op members that are still in the, in the co-op today, they were there that day saying, oh, I have a Moringa tree in my backyard. Would you like to come and harvest it? And I'm like, are you kidding me? This is crazy. I only had, you know, a couple of trees, a few, you know, a few branches at, at, for stock. I was really low, you know, and it takes a lot. It takes a, quite a bit of material to get to a product, to a finished product. So you sure. start with a huge tree and you're left with like a bottle of capsules, you know, so that was a process to get through and then to maintain. Like what's the, um, what's the weight ratio about for processing Moringa? Yeah. Four to one, usually four times wet is once one time dry. Yeah. Um, and then, um, so you, you were humping it at the farmer's market. Yep, that's how I started. I started and with my van. I, I'm assuming from there you did just more farmer's markets, right? I just started picking up more farmer's markets. Okay. And um, I, I actually attended a permaculture course. And uh -huh. while I was attending that permaculture course, I met someone in the course that wanted to essentially uh, renovate their entire yard into a food forest. And I said, can I move in? <laughs> Uh -huh. And I, I, became the, I became the garden boy, and I essentially okay. lived there. I managed uh, the owner's Airbnb as I was the manager of the garden, and I established the food forest right there in Seminole Heights. It's known as Zenden in Seminole Heights. I lived there for two years, and it's now a thriving, beautiful food forest with over 50 moringa trees and 100 different types of food. And, and, and you just go there, and it's just it's like your yard that you see right there. It's beautiful. That's awesome. Um, so we kind of skipped a step because you, so you, so you met somebody at the farmer's market and they're like, Hey, I have moringa trees in my yard. Um, and so I'm assuming at that point, like when did it dawn on you kind of like, Oh, wait a second. This is like, I don't need a big piece of land and I don't need a big farm. I can just keep going with this, uh, planting it in people's backyards. Um, like what point in this process did you have that aha moment or was it gradual it, or was it, it your plan from the beginning? You know, it, it, it was <laughs> never a plan from the beginning. It, it, right? it's, just, it's crazy. Cause like, you know, we have, we have these platforms available to us and when you start getting into that world of plants and you see these farmers and I think it was honestly, the architect, our, being an architect helped me to realize that I, I, I didn't have to do everything alone. Nothing in this world is a solo mission. And so all I had to do was have the idea and then try to educate others about this beautiful idea that I have and then just to get them on board. But that wasn't the only thing. I don't have to recreate the wheel. That's another thing that I learned from school is that all of the spaces that you ever see in any museum and any art gallery and everything, it's already been done before. You just have to put the pieces together. And so when I realized that co-ops already existed for seeds and swapping and then getting on Facebook groups and things like that and seeing this, I was like, wait, these people already have Moringa trees growing. They should be in the co-op. And so then I would recruit people that also already had Moringa trees growing in their yard like yourself that contacted me and saying, Hey, I have an eight year old Moringa tree. Would you like to come by and harvest it? You know, it's like, that's how most people get into the co-op and we study and we analyze the soil. You know, we make sure that it's in a safe zone and that it doesn't have any reclaimed water and it's all right. organic and all those things. And so everything's safe that way. And, um, and that was the aha was just, I don't have to have my own land. I didn't have my own land. There was no way that I was going to be able to get a large enough piece of land to, to sustain myself, you know, at the flip of a switch. And so I just needed to use other people's properties. And so I started becoming stewards. And that's what it was, too, was becoming a steward of, of my friend's property. For those two right. years, I realized, you know, like, this isn't mine. This is when Uber and a lot of other companies were starting, like, sh sharing, crowd sharing was starting to become more popular and things like that about five years ago. And that's 
that's essentially what started it was I, I just didn't want I didn't I, I had to get started somehow and I and I knew that one day like today that I would have my own piece of land and now we're set up like we've got thousands of trees already around town and I don't have to wait another two to three years before I can start harvesting trees here I can go out to the places that I've already established and they can support so is the plan to plant more trees on your property and where, where are you again you're in yep plant city you're plant city okay yep and we are. Um, so I mean that's kind of the plan or are, are you gonna continue with kind of the co-op idea of putting more trees in more people's yards absolutely and or put stuff on this property in Plant City. So you're yeah. doing both. So my property now is one location in the Moringa Growers Co-op. Okay, I got you. Right. So we have over 300 properties now in Tampa Bay, and my property is just one. It just so happens to be the headquarters, and I'm also the president and serving on the board of directors of the co-op. Gotcha. Okay. And um, – so are you looking for more spaces, more places to plant more trees? Yeah. And what is, uh, what's your bubble? Like the, uh, world, the world, we're global. The world. We're, global. we're global, baby. We going around the world. We got farmers in India. We got farmers in Mexico. We got farmers in South America. We have farmers all over the world. We have farmers in Africa. We've got farmers in California, Texas, Florida, all over. We have thousands of locations where people are just flooding our website saying we want to be in the co-op and so we're signing people up slowly as we get them their membership forms and we're developing the full full board of directors i'm getting a team together right now it's mostly about education we have to teach everybody about moringa first and that's why you and i are here right now today so yes i definitely want to get into that because i'm sure we're going to have people watching this video who don't know what the heck we're talking about um and um We'll get to that in just one second. Um, I guess what I'm curious about is what are they, like how does that work um, if somebody is in Georgia or Africa or the Caribbean and they're growing moringa, um, are they shipping the green stuff to you? Are they processing some where they're at? Like how decentralized is this? Very. How much is it decentralized with a centralized hub? Um, are they sending you stuff and you're packaging it? Are you sending them packaging material? Are these secrets that you don't want to tell anybody? No, no, it's, no. All just, it's all I'm open just source. Curious, I'm just curious how yeah. this works, you know, like, because uh, it's a really cool idea. It's all of um, the above that you just said. It's all oh. of that. It's literally <laughs> all of that. So okay. to break it down, let's just start with Tampa. You know, because here we are, we have the main headquarters here right now. And uh, think of it as like a franchise model. Each one right. of the chapter locations, whether it's in Brandon or it's in Bradenton or it's in Sarasota or Punta Gorda, we have these hubs where we say have, say, farmers that have more equipment and more space and more processing uh, capabilities. And so they've asked to serve as the president of their chapter. And so we have also growers and I have like a little bit of a like a display here of that where you can see we have the main chapter hub and then we have a surrounding area of moringa trees around that hub. And that's where these chapter locations, they each run independently, say like a franchise. You know, hey, they hold, on, hold on just a second. Is this available on your website, that map? Yes. Yes. So what's the website? You can visit newmanursery.com. And that's where we have mostly everything getting going right now for the nursery. And then we also have the moringagrowerscoop.org where we're getting that platform started right now. We're gathering information uh, uh, from farmers around the world. We have, a free, uh, we have a free manual right now that you can download um, on both platforms, either newmanursery.com or the moringagrowerscoop.org. And that you download that free manual, and that'll get you an introduction to the co-op. And did I spell that right? Yes, that's right. That yes, newmanursery.com. That has all the information there. That's where you can access me easily. We have all the products on there, and also you can download that free manual there. That'll help you introduce you to the co-op and the fundamentals, the mission, and essentially the structure and how it breaks down and how each of these uh, chapter locations operate. So. Now you've got different farms, different 
locations around these chapter hubs that have, say, maybe five trees or 10 trees or 100 trees. Now, some members, they don't want anything to do with their trees other than getting that moaning, you know. So others, they want to, say, have everything to do with it. They want to harvest it. They want to dry it. And they want to sell it back to us. And so we buy Moringa from these growers at every stage of the process that they want us to. And then we have so different there's a, I'm assuming there is, uh, you know, the more you do with it to get it back into your hands, the more uh, incentive, uh, whether it's financial. What, what are your incentives, by the way? So um, Because... You know, I haven't taken a dime from you, but I think we have a pretty sweet deal going on yeah. with one moringa tree. So what are the different incentives that you give these farmers? Uh, obviously, well, I don't know. Obviously, it might be is straight cash an option or, uh, you know. Okay. That's a good one. Let's start with that. Yeah. So we're providing stock in the co-op right now. So uh -huh. all of your weight that we've harvested from your tree we're going to be giving you a stock portfolio. It's going to be in our dashboard, in the Moringa Growers Co-op dashboard, where we can track all of your weight. We already have all your weight right now. We just dried a kilo worth of your greens last week. And so now you've generated probably at least 10 kilos over the past year, two years, from just your one tree. Now, since we harvested those tree, that tree, we're able to provide $10 a kilo on the market right now. That's what we just started. We just put that, we just put that bar there. Now, it's going to fluctuate as we actually go public. That cost is going to fluctuate in the future. Sure. But right now, now, what if I dried it? What if I harvest it and I dried it? If you harvest it and you dried it, I give you the full $30. 30 dollars. Okay. $30, $30 a kilo. A kilo. That's right. right. Now, you have to package it the way that we need it packaged, but that's all in the education process that we have in the membership. Okay. Um, that's really cool, man. <laughs> that's really, really cool. I didn't even know I was like, I was like, I was just happy to get the, uh, the the free goodies and to have you uh, clean up and maintain my tree. I know. We, you know, we were just picking at it. We just eat, you know, a little bit here and there of the of the raw stuff. But it's like, man, when that tree hit like four or five years old, I just couldn't keep up. Oh, my God. And I, I mean, you saw, too, I decided to put my aquaponics uh, right next to it. And back then... I actually had ducks in my backyard that would swim in that pond Aww. and splash all of the fish water out onto that tree, which yeah. is why I think it exploded like that. Yes. Is yes. basically. And then when I'm draining off the bottom of my aquaponics system, all the poopy water goes right there at the base of that marengo oh, tree, no which water. I think is what's really, yeah, that's what's blowing it up like that. Dude, that tree um, is amazing. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so. Uh, for for anybody watching, basically Kendrick comes and he harvests my tree for me, and then he leaves us this really cool box of uh, of an assortment of what they make. That thing right there, and uh, as a family, we all have our favorite things that are uh, in the box. Why don't you open that up and show everybody? This is his like general grab bag. Yeah, um, I need to get I need to get one with all the products in it. I don't have one. With you the don't products. have all the products in there. Oh no. I'll grab. I'll grab one. Should I grab yeah. one? Go grab one really quick. I'm I'll be one. talking about. Right um, yeah, yeah. Go grab one real quick. Yeah. So he basically comes in. My tree was a mess. Uh, I was shading out my nursery, and uh, he comes in my backyard uh, every few months, maybe every four to six months, and chops the branches off the tree and drags it out, cleans it up, does a great job, better job than I ever did on trimming this tree. Super careful. And trims it all in the right spots to get um, a maximum flush of uh, of more moringa off the trees. So, how many people do you have running around doing the uh, harvesting of the moringa? Just me. Just you. All right. <laughs> For a very short amount of time, you can get me as your personal moringa harvester. But we're building a team right now. I'm oh, absolutely. Yeah. Day. This is a limited time offer. Get me He's to come up. It is not going to be him. If you want this man in your backyard harvesting your your moringa tree, you need to call in quick. All right, there it is. Woo! So we've got products that come. We're about to ship this one out in the mail. This one's going out in the mail. We're going to just open this up. First of all, it's called the starter kit because it comes with seeds. So you can start your own trees. Now, if you've never tried Moringa before, it also has Moringa powder. Uh-huh. 
That's straight from the leaves. Then we add turmeric to make a spice to the green powder. Oh, that's my favorite right there. Yeah. I yeah. love it. Oh my God. It. Then from there, you know, of course, the green powder, you can make capsules out of it. Uh, we put the we put the loose leaf before you powder it. We put it in bags and we make a tea. It's essentially just dried green leaves and we added uh, some mint to it. So you have a loose leaf variety just with the moringa by itself. And that's so just with that tea, you get a lot of the vi you get the vitamins out, right? Just in the same way of eating it. Yeah, steep in the leaf. You can add this to as a dish, as a topping to anything. But also we added mint, which is very good for digestion, and it pairs really well with the moringa. So we it is it's delicious. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely delicious. And then so we have a cold press machine here at the farm and we make oil out of the out of the out of the seeds. So we press these seeds to make oil. And from there we make deodorants, we make salves, and then we also make bath bombs out of the moringa seed oil. Didn't y'all have a soap? Was there soap yes, too? We do. We do have soap here. Yeah, I love the soap. Those are my two favorites. So oh, yeah. Each one of these boxes are custom. You can customize these boxes on the website. Just put a note in there what you'd like in there. Essentially it's um it's it's a hundred and seventy dollar value for only seventy dollars. So it's a hundred. Is that value. and is that at newmanursery.com or it, is that okay? So that's where your store is as well, your yeah, online yeah. store? Online store. And you can even come in here, make an appointment, and you can come to the farm and you can see us personally. We have um, people coming in, strolling in between 10 and 2 every single day of the week. Right. And just to reiterate, so you are not just buying these and repackaging no. them. This is the real deal, y'all. This yeah. is the real deal. What yeah. was that last thing you were about to hold up? That's my uh, wife's favorite. Yes. Yeah. This is the extract. This is the sublingual extract that you put under the tongue. Yep. Yeah. That's what my wife uses the most. Yeah. So we usually, I like the um, turmeric powder um, and the tea and the soap and she likes that oil and the dried powder that she yeah. puts in her smoothies yep that's our favorites and this box here is actually a wealth of information this is a book in a box so i wrote this book inside here it has more information about moringa and then also more information about co-ops and how we started the co-op so why don't you uh open that book up and look at it and tell us a little bit about the moringa because we have not like what is so great about it um what is it what does it provide what makes this thing so special? Well, it's the it's a complete protein. And uh, in ancient Ayurvedic texts uh, from India, because Moringa is actually native to India and Africa, there's several different varieties of Moringa. But the one that we're talking about specifically here uh, to eat and cultivate is called the Olifera. Ole, uh -huh. ole is oil and Ifera, Ifera is producing. And so it's actually the Moringa oil producing tree. And you get most of the oil production from the seeds. And, and what the moringa tree produces is called a drumstick. And that's the fruit or the vegetable of the tree. And that's actually the highest prized, most, um, most hey, medicinal part. Of I have one in my backyard that fell. It was uh, when you harvested. You keep talking about it. I'm going to go grab the drumstick. I'll be right okay. back. Great. All right. So, so not only is it the fastest growing tree in the world, and is, is it a complete protein source, but it is also a very high in vitamin C. As you know, vitamin C is very good for the immune system. It's also very high in potassium. Potassium helps to build muscles. It's also very high in calcium for the bones. And uh, it has fiber. So when you actually eat the leaf, like say in a powder form, and you put it on, say, uh, any of your like oatmeal or breakfast dishes and your cereals, or, or even in your breads and you cook it in there, you're adding extra fiber to your meal. It's helping you go to the bathroom. That's helping to you to alleviate toxins from your system. Every single day, you should be thinking about how to cleanse and alleviate your body from free radicals, toxins. Every time you breathe, you're detoxing. Um, in a sense where I should say every time you breathe, you're breathing in, you're breathing in toxins right from, from the environment. And, and you want to be able to naturally detox and pass. One of the ways that we do that, we drink liquids, we drink water. Another way is to make sure that your diet is high in fiber so that way you're not letting the, the food sit in your digestive system uh, for more than you know 24 to 48 hours. And that really helps to keep your body flowing, keep you, you know, from having stinky breath <laughs> you know, and all kinds of things. Like Moringa can really help 
even if you've just never tried moringa before, start in a small do small amount and uh, see if you like it. You know, some people, they start with a little bit too much moringa and they actually say, hey, I, I ended up having to go to the bathroom a little bit too much. Okay, so so these are the drumsticks. And Did that's, you, you left all these in my backyard? Yeah. I okay. saw I saw th there was a little pile there. I meant to grab it. I forgot to grab that little pile that was on there. That's okay. That's okay. Th th that's great. And now, so, can I just eat these seeds? Yes. Yes, exactly. Here, let's eat a seed together. Well, hold on. That one's all dried up. Yeah, let's eat one together. All right, you got some water? You have some water with you, so you're going to chew this seed first. Yeah, it might it. be a little bit better. Yeah. And that's calcium. That crunch, that's calcium. That's for your bones. That's for your nails. Um, and so the oil that's actually found in the seed is high in antioxidants. It's high in amino acids. And then when you drink something. It gets sweet, right? Yeah, it turns sweet. So that's why I got yeah. they're actually a flocculant. So if you were to crush these seeds, like we just crushed in our mouth, and you put them in a glass of water, what would happen, especially if the water is really dirty and murky, it would flocculate. So it would it would pull all the toxins from the water, and it would coagulate at the bottom of the jar. And then you could scoop the water off the top, and that would be potable water. So say you're near a river or a stream, and it's really dirty, but you've got moringa seeds on you, you'll be able to... Uh, filter that water naturally using just moringa seeds alone. That's interesting because I had heard that it could be used to filter water and I always just assumed it was something with like, you know, they took the bark and like chopped it up and used the fibers or something. I didn't realize it was actually, you know, flocculating the particulates out of solution. That's awesome. Yeah, it's amazing. And that's why it's very, very highly prized in Africa and in India and in developing countries because um, it's helping to prevent malnutrition. And in children and in mothers, it actually helps increase lactation. Whoa. So it's crazy. Um, it has endless uses. So there's texts, ancient texts that say that it has over 300 known cures or preventative um, capabilities in these modern, in these modern medical uh, diagnoses. They help to reduce the symptoms of many of these problems that many people have. And, uh, and it's been said, it's been said this thousands and thousands of years ago. You can find it in uh, the, uh, the Mahabharata, actually. It's an ancient text in India. And it's an Ayurvedic herb. Moringa is an Ayurvedic herb. Now, what's, what's crazy, I want to get back to the drumstick real quick, is anytime you go to the store or you see someone from India, that's right, that's all they really want. They're like, you go Morongai, Moringa, Moringai. Um, drumstick tree, all they want are those drumsticks. There's, that's the highest prized part of the whole tree because what does it look like? You know, what does that look like? If you were to say, say like walnuts look like a brain, you know, those are for your brain. Tomatoes, you cut it open, it looks like a heart. It's for your heart. Carrots, you cut it open, that's for your eyes. It looks like an eye. Well, that is actually for the reproductive organs. You know, the drumstick, it has a seed inside. It's for the male and female parts. It helps to cleanse the uterus. It helps to cleanse the prostate from heavy metals. The number one killer in men is prostate cancer. You know, not old age. Usually it comes with complications to prostate cancer. And so what Indians I find whenever I go to the farmer's market or anything like that, usually the guys are coming up to me and saying, hey, you got any of that drumstick? Because I need to make sure I, I can go back to the bedroom because it helps with circulation. It helps with uh, male enhancement. It helps with all of those things. I know that might be a little controversial, but uh, test it out for yourselves. <laughs> well, it's not controversial that that's what they believe. <laughs> yeah. There's, I mean, There's no controversy there that that's what they believe. It's true. So, yeah. And, and I love so it. You're I speaking love truth. That is what they believe. Good. Um, what part are they after? Do they eat that this whole thing? Right That's right. So when they're young and they're green and they're on the tree, they go oh, in. Oh, about the drumstick, not the, not the people from India, not when they're young. Yeah. When the drumstick's young. When the, well, what I'm saying is that older gentlemen all over the world, especially from India, they'll come up to me and say, hey, 
I'm having a little trouble with circulation. Do you have any of those drumsticks, buddy? And I say, hey, yeah, I got those drumsticks for you because that way they're like, okay, good, because I'm having a little bit of pain in my prostate. I need to get some cleanse. I need to cleanse that out. And I say, great, I'll get you some drumsticks. So what they do traditionally is they chop the young green drumsticks up into soup, and it's called sambar. It has, it's a tomato-based soup. Essentially, you just chop those young green moringa uh, drumsticks up, and you put them and boil them in soup. How do you and spell that name? Sam sambar. S-A-M-B-A-R. Sambar. Soup? Sambar, yeah. Essentially, that's soup. That means soup. So I'm assuming that if people jot this down right here, they will be able to look up a recipe? That's right. Sambar, yep. Sambar soup. Traditional drumstick sambar, you know, those types of things. That's That's usually the number one way that... Indians, Africans, Filipinos, Chinese, uh, South Americans consume moringa as a whole worldwide. It's mostly from the drumsticks. Okay. Wow. And it just so happens that the leaves is a byproduct of having the tree because it was really developed for the drumstick. And now we have the most nutritional terrestrial plant in the whole entire planet. And that's the entire tree itself is edible moringa. It, it so, sounds to me like your co-op idea has this whole other area. If it's a byproduct of an already existing industry. Um, wow. So it's like Tampa and then the rest of the world. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's, that's, that's amazing. And is it for the people in India? Uh, I'm assuming um, because that's where it's from that what they are using that it's grown there. They're not importing it. No, from no they, they produce 99% of the world's Moringa supply today. They produce 99% of the world's oh, supply Moringa. of a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Moringa oleifera. So like there's 13 varieties of Moringa around the world and uh, the other 12 are native to Africa. So when you, when, when we say native to where, you know, it's like, well, there might have been plants uh, like Moringa, uh, the ancestors of Moringa, on a land mass that was connected all at once before they broke off and traveled to, say, the Himalayan mountains to create India. Moringa was already there on that land mass, and so that developed into Oleifera. But there's still African Moringa, which has 12 other varieties. Some are short and bushy. Some are tall and lanky. Some are big and robust trunks that you might see sometimes in the Sahara as like these really like uh, uh, what do they call those uh, ro uh, ro ro rotunda kind of like this really big round and then skinny at the top with a little bit of greens at the top. That's a type of moringa tree, and people don't even realize that that they may look and look at Africa uh, photos of Africa Sahara, and that's a type of moringa tree out there. Um. What about the leaves? I mean, like, so I'm assuming that the, how do you pronounce it again? The one that you grow? Oleifera. Oleifera. Yeah. I'm assuming that one, because you said uh, that one is grown and cherished for its oily seeds. That's right. Um, so I'm assuming the other varieties don't have as much oil in the seeds. That's true. Uh, what about the nutritional content of the leaves? Have you done right. any studies or know anything about that or... Yeah, you know, and um, and this this has all been fun, found by medical uh, universities, and everything here that I'm saying is proven. Um, I'm not a doctor by any means. I'm not a scientist, but it's all already been out there, and that's why I really, when I when I found this and I saw what this has already been said, it's already been done. I'm not going to be saying anything that I'm, it's going to get me into trouble or anything like that. This has already been proven. This stuff oh, is you mean you're not reinventing the wheel? No, and I'm not. I'm not even <laughs> saying anything that's controversial in a sense. Right. There were, th there were some things that I was like, well, maybe I should start with this, and I was like, nah, you know, that's not even as, you know, it's not even as well known. But when I really, really got into uh, the science of moringa. I mean, it's abundant. The leaves, uh, the drumstick, but also the seeds. When you eat the seeds, you press the seeds for oil and you consume that oil. You put that oil on your skin, your hair, your nails. It helps with cuts and bruises and infections. It's antibacterial, antimicrobial, antifungal. And this is including with the leaves. The leaves are also naturally um, 
They help cleanse heavy metals from the body. So same thing with the seeds. All of them pretty much have the same kind of constituent properties. And they just, you know, are a little bit different depending on, you know, your because you, even as an example, you were talking about the extract. A lot of people get this bottle confused with, say, an oil. And they're like, hey, how much is the oil and what does the oil do? And they're like, well, what's the difference between the oil and the extract? We derive the extract from the leaves and we use alcohol. We steep the leaves in alcohol to get the pure uh, to get the pure benefits of the leaf extracted. So that's a tincture. This is essentially a tincture, yes. Okay, okay. And gotcha. then and then the the oil is a cold press. That's literally just a machine pressing the seeds and pressing the oil out of the out of the seeds it's not extracting i guess you could call it a form of extraction but it's a cold press um and so you're actually just getting the straight oil from the seeds like if you were to take one of these seeds and just press it with your finger let's go in so like the oil part is actually inside here this little white thing that's inside that's actually where the oil comes from the oil is really from in here and so when you press this even with your hands and your fingers and you squeeze that You'll even sometimes see a little bit of oil on your hands, and that's that's we have to press a thousand of these seeds to get one to two ounces worth of oil. Holy crap! Yes. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, man, that almost makes it. Those guys who are eating the drumsticks green, it almost seems like a huge waste. But I guess I hope it's really good for them. <laughs> it's it's amazing. It does, I hope it does what they think it's going to do. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Especially, I mean, if you've gone, you know, like we eat healthy, so we may not have experienced some of that that just yet. But sometimes if someone's experiencing, uh, experiencing uh, blood pressure issues or circulation issues, I mean, even just a slight, slight, uh, not thinning of the blood, but just better circulation of the blood. I mean, they're back to their their younger self. Sure. And uh, and so. Uh, we even came out with a blog last week, erectile dysfunction. You know, it talks about are you suffering from erectile dysfunction and talking about the benefits of incorporating Moringa in your everyday diet just to help increase your circulation and to help regulate your blood sugars and blood pressure. It's a real big thing. So we have our first uh, real question, and it was one I was actually thinking about as well. It's from Yvonne. Um I don't know if that's supposed to say by Florida. It says by Philippe. Um, so it says is under watch for potential invasiveness. Oh, yes. Worry. Yes. So, so, so I talk a little bit about that. And that's actually why I was getting into the properties of the other 12 varieties. Um, because I'm just thinking if we had more access to different varieties with slightly different profiles, instead of trying to put this one, like we might find better ones that work better in certain areas because of maybe where they're from. I don't know. I, that's why I was, that's what I was poking at mm -hmm. um, as far as trying to find out if we can get the same benefits, health benefits from these different other varieties of, of trees. What, what, what uh, Avon is, is asking is exactly what I was poking at. Okay. So, so to cover, like say the benefits, like does the other, do the other varieties have the high potency as Olifera? And that's what Olifera was developed for over thousands of years by man to be such high potent, such a high potent plant. And so, given uh, given the natural environment that it's in, say like in Africa, I I don't really know. I haven't done much more research other than the Olifera itself. I'm excited to get into the other parts of marine because I've really just touched the surface just in the last couple of years. Right. Um. But let's let's go into that invasive property that we were talking about because that's a big one that we get all the time, especially with like say the Florida Herbal um, Herbalists and the Native Plant Society of Florida. And I totally agree. You know, it's all about safety and numbers and making sure you're planting these in residential areas or places that you can keep it contained in a sense. But the reason why it's considered an invasive plant is because it has wings on its seed. And so as long as you have a winged seed, you have to classify that as potential for spreading from the tree. And so if it has a potential of being able to be flown in the wind and spread away from the main tree, then it could be considered invasive. Um, and, and what would happen if the state of Florida declared it an invasive plant to where 
nurseries and farmers would actually have to register all of their trees. Well, guess what? We already are a step ahead of the curve. We're already been in conversation and talks with the state of Florida. And as long as we're tracking and managing and monitoring all of our Moringa trees in the co-op, then that's safety in numbers. And we have the support of the state of Florida in that way because the state of Florida already is growing millions and millions of Moringa trees. And they're making billions of dollars off of this industry because it is a cash crop. It is the fastest growing tree in the world. You can grow it as an annual and they're growing it all over the world. Is, and for instance, if you want to talk in real invasive, you really want to get down to it, 90% of all of those plants that you're growing in your backyard, they're not native to North America. No, not at all. No. Right. So what are we really talking about? Right. I don't know. I don't well, even know. That's, I, I think you hit it on the head is that the best thing you can do to get in front of it is to buddy up with the state of Florida because yep. – I mean, they can do their studies where they're at, and they're still going to be way more limited, I think, than um, you maybe letting them in on, you know, you have more trees in more places, more different environments around Florida than, you know, if they had a couple of farms down in Balm or wherever their farms are, um, they're not really studying. I just think you have more variables available yep. um, to them and, and for their research. Um so are you thinking it is – they're keeping an eye on it for invasiveness oh, yeah. strictly because the seeds are winged? Or did they see something else going on with the tree or with the plant, or do you not know? I um, know that politics play a big role in this game, in this money game. Florida is a very high ag agricultural state. Yes. It focuses mostly on its ag, and there are already money, big, big money being made here. And if you're talking about bringing in something else that's going to be taking money away from an already existing industry, they don't want it. I mean, we're bringing in billions of dollars worth of revenue, but it's something different. And you know how hard it's been to get off of coal and oil. I think there's – um, I mean, if we want to get our tinfoil hats on, I'm going to start – I'm going to start – keeping a tinfoil hat whenever I do these interviews next to me, because about every other one, I get into something where I'm like, if I were to get my tinfoil hat out, I'm actually have one. I'm going to put it on. Yes. Uh, my tinfoil hat theory is that it is not just the state of Florida. There's a hidden, there's a, there's somebody behind the curtain that nobody ever talks about. And those are the, uh, the, the cog in the wheel that has to do with distribution mm -hmm. of, um, like, I, in, in other words, I don't think it's the farmers. I don't think it's the state. I think the people behind the curtain that are the most worried about losing their dollars are, and, and most worried about who's growing what and where are the big, big time distributors. It's not Publix. It's not the grocery stores. It's not the actual farmer that's growing it. Um, it's the people who are just sitting there on a computer and moving numbers around basically as far as our food system or any other cash crop. I think they're the ones who are secretly controlling what we're growing, how much of it we're growing, how much we're allowed to grow. I honestly don't think that Florida would be anywhere near where we are right now as far as diversity in agriculture had it not been for citrus greening. I, oh, I think yes. citrus greening actually helped us. I think that's one of the reasons why we have more mangoes that are more frost tolerant. Yeah. And it's one of the reasons why we have more peaches that are more heat tolerant. Had yeah. it not been for citrus greening, I think you'd still have just acres and acres and acres and billions of acres or however many acres of citrus all around the state. I don't even oh. think we'd hemp legal at this point if it wasn't for citrus greening. You know, it's funny you say that Florida citrus, citrus is, is native to Asia. So right. what are we really saying here? Right. Yeah. <laughs> I don't understand it. Where are you from? I'm a European. I'm not from Florida or from here. Well, I know their concern <laughs> with the invasives is, it, it, you know, it doesn't just have to do with the fact that it's not here. It has to do with the fact of if it gets out, how aggressive. Where? Out where? where? We don't have anywhere that's not touched. Right. There's no more land that has not been touched. There's no wild. Florida was leveled in the 1800s. Everything is parceled out. Everything is 
taken and, and accounted for everything. And so what we're doing as a co-op is we're helping the state and the country and the world to track and monitor all these moringa trees. So that way we know who's growing them, where they're at, if they're healthy, if they're spreading, if they're getting out of control. And that's what we're here for. And that's what we're going to help to do and continue. Well, I, I, I think that's where you and I would probably divert on. Uh, and I think I could probably bring you over to my side on, on the dangers of invasives. Um, you know, I don't, I don't want to derail the conversation, but I do want to say, you know, for, for me, it is about the few native species of, of various things. Cause, cause to me, if, the classifications of invasive and the levels of their danger it it it's you know we have things that are not considered invasive um that do get out and they do spread but maybe not as aggressive that's right we have things that if you're growing it in your yard are very aggressive but they also don't have a tendency to get out that's right so they're not necessarily considered invasive we have other ones that get out but they um they don't uh, compete with our with the things that are native um there's a name for that once they once things that don't compete or, or affect the native species um and, and they've been here a while it's called like normalized or something yes. like that there's a yes. word for it um once those things so we do have a lot of that but you know to me the classifications of the real things that are 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 legitimately considered class one class two and class three yes. invasive Yes, I really I do believe that there is a danger to that because of the the danger to the remainder of the things. Um, I think it is, you know. So basically what I'm getting at is for them to truly make that classification and that determination. They need a lot of information. It's a lot. It's a lot to assimilate. You can't do it uh, not knowing, you know certain things about plants and how they operate. Like you said, those different classes, I tell people all the time, well, it's not a vine. It's not kudzu. That's for sure. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't just crawl up everything and cover forests. You know, it's, um, it is the fastest growing tree in the world, but it, it also, if, if it's untouched and it's left on its own, it's very lanky and it doesn't get very big. It's only when you cut it back and harvest it, and use it the way that we use it that you're creating a more robust and bigger tree because we're forming it and shaping these trees like an architect would build a house or a building to create much more of that uh yield that we're achieving as a cultivated plant have you have you come across any trees or been pointed to any trees that have maybe just been sitting there for a long period of time and just being allowed to grow and drop their drumsticks and grow and drop their yes. drumsticks does are there pups everywhere i mean is no. it okay not I mean, like I, no quad I, mean, my it's experience not like is I have i have i have trouble getting these damn things to germinate you know, know. like it's not easy um and so the, the trees i've seen classified as invasive it's like you blink wrong and the wind carries the seeds and it's growing over there or it spreads from its roots really no. easily or both or no. both you know and no, i have never seen also... a mega tree at yeah. all in my backyard. Um, so I, I'm assuming Yvonne that basically what is happening is just because it's new and because it's get, getting planted out so much um, that, that they're just keeping an eye on it um, yes. for invasiveness. And yes. I mean, I got to give it to them though. When you watch this tree grow and when you watch it drop its drumsticks and the speed at which people are planting it, you know, it, it's probably a good idea. They are keeping an eye on it. Because, yeah, you know, if there ever was one to get out and become a problem, I could see it being moringa. But I, I agree with you, Kendrick. Like, from what I've experienced, it ain't going to ever be one. No, I, I, it's food. It's right. food. So the more that you, you know, grow it and harvest it, you're just, it's, it's, that's, you can't. So you mentioned something about the root. So it doesn't spread from the root either. It's not like a banana or it's not like a, like a bamboo where it's going to just spread from the root either. We don't see these little pups and babies popping up from the mothers like like you see other things like loquats and longins and things like that. Um, you know, so, you know, it's very low on the invasive list. Right, right. And I just also don't see it ever being... Even if it ever did, I don't think it would be, you know, north of Bradenton no. that it would ever be considered because if every three to five years you're getting hard freezes, it's never going to really spread. 
you know, like if, if, and I think it's a big, if it was ever classified and regulated as a, as an invasive, there would probably be a line across Florida and they'd be like, okay, anything South of this, you got to get a license. You got to be regulated anything North of this. And I think that line would probably be whatever that zone is Bradenton. And then, and then down over where they basically never freeze, you know, yeah, yeah, exactly. For every 10 or 15 years, maybe uh, get a freeze. Basically if you can grow coconuts, they would probably regulate moringa if it ever became invasive. Yeah, um, and they would probably regulate it because of the health benefits before its invasiveness. Because you know, and that's a really good point. They would call it invasive to regulate it because they're trying to regulate the money. You know, yes, they're and trying to regulate the money. You know, I just I thought it was really speaking of that. Um, God, we've been going for an hour and fifteen minutes. Rock on. Yes. Um, uh, I thought it was really interesting. Where speaking of mon the money. In the state of Florida, um, the year that uh, the legalization of medical marijuana first went on the ballot, I'm sure you, I don't, you might not have been here, but the wording of it was all screwed up. So basically, if you wanted it and you read it, and unless you've like majored in logic, you wouldn't have caught that if you wanted it, you were supposed to vote no or something like that uh. because they jacked the wording of it up so bad and it barely lost. But that year um, they had, uh, they were given out for the, for the major nurseries that were going to be given the first licenses to grow it. They were doing it on a license on a, on a lottery basis. So that meant I could have applied and gotten one. I think they were given out five licenses. You had to have, you know, this, the the ability to show that you could generate this much revenue i i couldn't have gotten that i wouldn't but it, but if i had gotten myself to the point um uh, as a business i could have theoretically gotten one of those five golden tickets or however many there were um and that was the year it was all jacked up mm -hmm. the year it went on the ballot where it was crystal clear if you want this vote yes if you don't want this vote no they had already promised the first five vouchers out to the biggest nursery families, the good old boy networks that were in Florida. So I, I kind of don't think that was an accident um, because uh, they didn't jack that wording up until kind of at the last minute. And I think that the people who pulled the strings uh, with the nurseries probably were not very happy that they could potentially have not gotten the licenses to grow oh, the yeah. hemp and to grow the medical marijuana here in the state. So I wouldn't doubt it as the money keeps pouring in for this plant. If you do start seeing some, sure. Some, some backwards right, on a good note with Florida on a good, good. Note, I'm going, I'm going way off here, but on a good note in Florida, those families that own those big nurseries, the good old boy network in Florida. Yeah. They weren't a bunch of white people. <laughs> Just no. so you know, Florida what? is unique like that. I'm not saying that's a good thing or bad thing. But some of our good old boy network money, it ain't white money. Wow, that's good. I'm glad to hear you that. Know, yeah, they were they were definitely uh, uh, families from the Miami area that owned some of these uh, very large nurseries that had enough pool. Uh, you know, take that information as you will. It is one of the things I love about Florida is we're not as straightforward, uh, good old you know uh, cracker cowboy uh, money. That's further north in florida as you get further south in florida we got some interesting uh dynamics as far as which families are kind of controlling the flow we got I that here that. In tampa. yeah we got that here in tampa too we got a neat uh background in um uh, cuban culture here in, in tampa which oh, i love yeah. with Ebor and anyway um i didn't mean to jump off subject there but you were talking right. about kind of the control and the pull of our agricultural uh, monies and you know um, you just said a lot of things about this plant and about the monies that kind of reminded me of the hemp industry yeah and, and with the, yeah all the way from you talking about your cold press to the money and their the invisible people controlling it and um, you yeah, know that's that's just uh, that's very interesting so uh, anything you want to say uh, what you got going on uh, I don't want to go on too much longer but I did want to know if you have anything coming up in the future that we need to be keeping an eye on yeah um, yeah so this saturday this saturday october 3rd we're having our first farmer's market here at numa farms 
on the two and a half acre property in Plant City. So we're opening. So it's, actually, for, it's actually at the farm. Yes. Yes. We're opening what it up. Of, what kind of vendors do you have, or is it just you guys and and just the farm? Right now, it's our it's just ourselves. We've reached out okay. to several vendors. They're going to get back to us. We have a few um, events scheduled. We have pretty much a schedule between. 9 a.m. We're gonna have a free donation-based yoga class. Yeah. Um, and so at 9 a.m. you can come. We'll have yoga back here on some of the ground cover, and we'll just uh, sun sal before the event. And then starting at 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. we have a few things planned. We're gonna talk everything moringa. We're gonna have a workshop about moringa. I'm gonna essentially just have my uh, have our products out, and we're gonna talk everything moringa, the products, how to grow, harvest, package and possibly start your very own ring of business and how you okay. can make a hundred thousand dollars potentially right. one year growing moringa so you were calling in a farmer's market but i'm hearing what it is actually right now is an educational moringa party it's starting up yeah, it is it we're gonna party it's the moringa party <laughs> we're gonna do the moringa definitely but in order for us to run we have to walk and i have yeah. to show people that this is where they want to be on saturday morning especially with everything going on. I haven't been to a farmer's market since March. I don't even right. know. A lot of the vendors have been out of, have gone out of business. Right. So it's like, I, I just wanted to get it out there. We're saying that it's a farmer's market because we want to attract all gotcha. of our friends that we've been at the farmer's market for over five years now. And we're going to bring <laughs> them around here because as soon as we said it, we've already got the whole entire state saying we're coming from Orlando, we're coming from Miami, we're coming from Tallahassee, we're coming from all over the state are just going to come here and we're going to talk Moringa. And it's going to be because this is a farm. Like this is the Moringa farm. This is the Moringa hub that we're starting here in Plant City. And uh, we actually have several co-op locations with hundreds of Moringa trees in the neighborhood here already. So it's one of the reasons why I was really happy to get here into Plant City. Of course, you know, the long history of Plant City with the strawberry um, industry and we're also going to be bringing in Moringa. How many acres you got there? Two and a half. Two and a half acres. That's awesome, man. That's great. Well, Kendrick, thank you so much. I'm going to touch base with you um, probably around the holidays and see see what's going on. This is uh, this is exciting. I think um, I think you see a real clear path uh, for what's to come next. But I also have a really strong feeling. I think you do too. That you got some surprises coming your way as well. Um, oh, yeah, and I can tell you're you're the type of guy who can really take the blow in stride. And um, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I think you got some cool stuff coming your way uh, that you've planned on. I think you got some cool stuff coming your way that you don't even know about yet, man. Thank I can, you. I can definitely see that. This is super super exciting. Thank you so much for being on with me, um, everybody who is just tuning in um, or watching this on record. I am live every Wednesday at 5.30 on Facebook at WhitwamOrganics.com. Uh, I'm sorry, Facebook.com slash WhitwamOrganics. I also have a YouTube channel that I promise I will be putting some unique content on here eventually. And maybe even one day won't be on Facebook as much and will be just exclusively uh, broadcasting live onto the YouTube channel. But I know there's a lot of people out there for differing reasons who might not want to be on Facebook so much over the next couple of weeks because it's going to be a real shit show. Um, but so I, so I do have, uh, I'm simulcasting right now to YouTube. So if you don't want to be on Facebook, um, you can still tune in and watch and ask questions and talk to me. Uh, every other week I have a guest on. Uh, and so every other week I'll just be talking about a garden topic or something that uh, I found to be very interesting. Thank you so much, Kendrick. Thank I really you. appreciate your time with us today Thank and uh, happy growing, man. Thank you. Prosperous growing. Peace. All right. Peace.